Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan for Inside the Birds. What a busy weekend for the Philadelphia Eagles as they have their offensive and defensive coordinator intact. We have a lot to talk about, a lot of coaching staff moves that will ensue. We got a lot of great, great topics here to discuss on Inside the Birds. And of course, uh, Adam and I will be in Mobile, Alabama this week at the Senior Bowl. Uh, a chance to catch up with a lot of people around the league, not just see the players, but Adam and I go from an Intel standpoint to try to catch. That's really the Adam, the the big thing is, you know, networking, mingling with people that we know. And, and, and this is an, an important time because as moves are still being made, it's, it's a really good chance to, uh, to get some info. Yeah. I'm there strictly to get information. That's all I do there is, is um, I'm gathering information for free agency is the number one thing I'm there for. Some for the draft, and that's it. I've done it for 23 years. I never change it. I'm, you know, I, you know, I work alone pretty much, hobnobbing and getting information and talking to people, and kind of got some good tips in 2002, building that, and it's, uh, it's kind of the same thing, but it's it's a rite of passage for me. Um, my first senior ball was Javon Walker, Josh McCown, wow. Brian Westbrook, some of the people there. I actually looked it up last week. I was very curious about some of the players and B West. Yeah, that was the one. That was the one. I, I love, I love going though. I got to tell you, and by the way, we're going to have good weather this week. I cannot believe it. It's like, I don't want to jinx it. Though. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, it's funny. My memories of my first senior bowl were more uh, working for Comcast sports net, you know, and at one point they, I think they sent me down twice once by mm -hmm. myself. Uh, one time I went with Derek Gunn and he helped me, you know, learn the TV ways of doing things. And I did a lot of TV interviews for CSN the next time around by myself, I was able to do it. But my memories are, you know, trying to do like five different shows for CSN oh my God. in a day. And then the, the the gatekeeper of Lad People Stadium trying to kick me out while it was getting super dark. But I do think my first one was the Marcus Smith Senior Bowl, uh, who wound up becoming an Eagle. And, and um, you know, he's been on our platform. He's got a tremendous story of uh you know self-preservation after a really tough year you know uh, football career that started with the eagles as a first round pick but that i believe was my first senior bowl 2014 yeah, that's 2014 yeah. just so you know wow that was 2014 yep ah, maybe reason. it was now that i think about it though yeah. maybe it was the year before then that was my first one the before. only reason why i know is because i remember going on the show nfl insiders mm -hmm. saying the eagles are very high on market smith who's a outside linebacker pass rusher stand-up guy from Louisville, and I'm thinking there's just it's okay. It was kind of like you know I got a good tip. I didn't think it was going to be the guy. I don't. I it's so long ago. I have no idea who else they were looking at. I couldn't begin to tell you. Like certain years, you and I probably could say okay. In 2015, okay, it was you know the Brandon Cooks one. You know, I could go down this five players that they wanted in order. I couldn't. I have no idea. I just remember. No, no, no. I'm sorry. That was the same draft. It was a Brandon Cooks draft. It was yeah. Marcus Smith was the one where they tried to trade out yep. and they couldn't. And I, I, Mark Smith's probably eighth on their list, and oh well. But I'm glad that Mark is doing okay. That's the main thing. It's all that really yeah. matters. Um, but yeah, that that's what happens sometimes. You can't trade out. You, a lot of teams have gone through this. You have your board, it's stacked, and when it gets obliterated, man. But 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 you have all those trade calls you made before the draft, and you're hopeful that those agreements happen. Uh, the Eagles had a they were working on um, trade with the, the Jets. In 2019, uh, the Jets wanted Mikal Hardman, and they didn't get him. So the Chiefs did, and they traded out. Uh, yep. I think they wound up either pick, trading out or pick someone else. I can't remember, but yeah, that's amazing. Wow, Marcus Smith, long time. Long time. Yeah, definitely. All right, so um, we're going to get into some some things that we're going to do at the Senior Bowl for our viewers, both our mainstream viewers and our Patreon viewers. But I really want to get your big picture takeaway but and before we start to get into the moves that the eagles made i would like your big picture very sort of generic takeaway here from a weekend that landed vic fangio as the eagles defensive coordinator and kellen moore as the eagles offensive coordinator well first of all and a surprise they actually announced the vic fangio hiring you know historically they don't make any announcements other than head coach until the staff is completed and it's not completed, so there are going to be some changes with some of the assistants on both sides of the football. So, yeah, uh, my, my I would say this, and no no offense to Brian Johnson or Sean Desai, these are two major upgrades. They're experienced coordinators, two, two of the best, some of the best in the National Football League. And the Eagles had company with uh, Kellen Moore. Uh, good job by Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni to make sure this got done. 
you know, Saturday evening. But it's just great. Home run hires. And I, I, you know, we'll get into it as we break down the intel and what we know so far and uh, what, what to expect. But I, I, I got to give the Eagles credit. Obviously, they're very close to Vic. It's a very unique story, by the way. Do you know of any story where a guy who had no connection other than he's from Philly and coached for the Philadelphia Stars, his first pro job in 1985, but with the Eagles, do you know of anyone who, like some guy out of work, or even with any team, anyone you could think of, who sort of prefer, becomes a friend of the organization like this? This is it's really odd. It, it, it was very strange. It almost felt like he always wanted to be here, which we know he did. You know, we know he was here for a reason. And if everything had worked out normally, with Jonathan Gannon, as far as him getting a job sooner than he did, uh, then I think Vic Fangio would have already been here. Uh, I've spoke to a couple of people around the league. I know you and Andrew DiCecco talked about this in the last podcast, which, by the way, great, great job by Andrew DiCecco as he continues to really establish himself. I, I listened to the pod. I thought you and him did an amazing job. So was great. appreciate Andrew filling in. He had some really good stuff on um, from some sources that told him what it's like to play for Fangio as far as communicating. And that's really important because communication was such an issue with the Eagles uh, defense last year. So, um, no, I, I think that, you know, this was the, the marriage that should have happened. It just happened a, a, a year late. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I could have sworn we talked to um, before Gannon and Sirianni were hired. Well, did they? Did we not put it out that they had some interest in Fangio, but he was not going to coach that year? He was going to take the year off, so it didn't matter. But I, it, didn't they do research on Fangio then? I'm, I'm, I, I think it's three years ago, but I they? think so because they were already sort of morphing themselves with the hire of Nick Sirianni into the Fangio scheme, you yeah. know, because they knew when they hired Nick, right? That I'm sure Nick sold them. Uh, they they knew about John Gannon. We knew that. We reported yeah. that, and we yeah. knew John was going to going to bring here. And even though he came from more of a Mike Zimmer foundation and the right. matt Eberflus foundation yeah. that he was going to introduce fangio concepts which he did right from the start as far as using five-man fronts using a nose tackle right well they didn't they used a five-man front they didn't have jordan davis in year one but they were certainly playing different alignments fletcher cox in the four i remember all the the oh. issues early on that, that i had with that so he was starting to bring it in so you knew that the eagles not only liked the concept of the fangio uh defense but then obviously the next year after that or last year bringing him in as an advisor. So that's why I felt like it was meant to be. And, you know, I know you guys talked about this in the podcast, so I'll just reiterate. There are some people who felt like he wanted to be up North all along. He's from Pennsylvania. He's got family here. And then as you guys talked about, there are also um, people who felt that the dolphins have a very, you know, different kind of coaching staff outside of Vic Fangio, especially on offense, they're younger. And there was sort of a brackish mix between his old school approach and, and maybe a, I guess a younger, more progressive minded dolphins staff. So obviously it led to them parting ways mutually. And here we are with Vic Fangio. Uh, so my takeaway on that matches yours. And before I get into my takeaway, I want to remind everybody inside the birds is presented by ocean casino resort in Atlantic city. It's the exclusive Jersey shore resort of inside the birds. And for those watching on YouTube, no, Adam and I did not, share a memo that today was going to be uh navy blue zip up day so <laughs> him and his vineyard vines me and my uh my under armor but um uh, my takeaway adam is when you said experience like the first thing i have when i sat back and think thought about this it feels like more of an adults in the room type of conversation here and uh, again just like you said no disrespect to brian johnson but that was his first year as an offensive coordinator in the nfl no disrespect to Sean Desai, who had only been a coordinator once before, right? He had risen the ranks, but a year, really right? One year of coordinator. Now you've got guys who have done this job for multiple teams and multiple years, and they have a track record in places where they have had great success. Vic has had, I think I wrote it in the story on inside the birds.com. He's had the number one ranked defense at least two or three times in the NFL as either a coordinator or a head coach, and he's got many top five top 10 defenses. And in a short amount of time, um, Kellen Moore has had two number one offenses in total yards when he was with the Cowboys for four years. So these are guys who have experience, who have done the job, have worked for different head coaches, different teams, have had success. Not every year are they top five, but they've had enough success for you to believe that they can come in here and make a big difference. Now, the second takeaway to this, Adam, would be this is that, now it's on Howie Roseman, especially on defense here, yep. to make sure that Vic 
has something to work with because you can have Vic Fangio, but if you don't have good players, it doesn't matter. You can have Bill Belichick, right? It doesn't really matter. You've got to get him the right type of players to succeed. Yeah, I just want to add this, and kudos to both of those coordinators in that, look, Sirian is on the hot seat. Let's let's be real here. Because this has been, and we've talked about this before from talking to coaches, they don't like to go somewhere where they know that the head coach could be out after the year that they come there. So, and I get Vic's older, he's from the area, he's got plenty, made a lot of money in his career and his life. He's he's winding down his mid-60s now. And he wanted to come up, okay. But for Kellen Moore, he... um. As we understand, he had he had, he had opportunities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so look, that's and Kellen's moved around from from Dallas in three years, Dallas, L.A., and now back to boy. Talk about the coast to coast. Holy smokes! So, <laughs> well, you're out west, Midwest, or whatever you want to call it, mid south for wrestling, <laughs> and East Coast in Philly. Yeah. So that, that's a lot of movement for a family. And now he's a young guy, turns thirty six. But uh, look, good job by the Eagles to get this done. Now, uh, we'll get in. We'll kind of break down if there are any negatives. And I, I you called it right, uh, the 100%. Howie's got a lot of work to do in the back seven. You, you, and I, we understand, folks. We say this every year, and we try to be better with this because we forget sometimes. Free and see lasts pretty much all year in terms of going from March until the beginning of the season. And plus, you know what they did that one year with uh, bringing them two D tackles. But it, we know, understand first – Three, four weeks is when a heavy free agency period happens. How he's generally understanding if you want to get to the Super Bowl or make a run again, you got to take a step back and look at what the roster really is. And they've got um, a lot of older players. They have a lot of guys who have not proven themselves in the back seven. And they've got a lot of work to do. They, they, the offense, quite frankly, should be super with Kellen Moore. We'll, get, we'll break him down as well. But it's you're right. You nailed it. Vic Fangio needs help here. He can't do it on his own. And we know he'll hire some of his coaches, some of his assistants that know the scheme or familiar with it. But the, the the talent level is clearly not good enough in the back seven. And I don't see how anyone could debate it, to be honest. Yeah, no, this has to be a defense offseason. I, I think Helen Moore could walk in to this offense right now with very little changes. We'll see what happens on the offensive line uh, and at number three receiver. But like basically, he's got the tools right now to produce a top five offense in the NFL. Vic Fangio needs a lot of help. He needs help at linebacker. He needs help at safety. He needs help at nickel. He needs help at outside corner. And he's going to need some reinforcements on the D-line as well. So this is a big offseason for Howie. And I know you guys talked about it on the last pod. I'll just I, – I wrote a column about it on InsideTheBirds.com. I'd like people to check out. I didn't think Howie was as accountable as – he has been accountable at times. When he screws up, he'll say, I was married to this or I should have done that. I, I was a little sure. surprised about the aberration – Remark. Got to make sure that this was just an aberration, or maybe it wasn't an aberration. Whatever his point was, um, I just that that m- sort of unnerved me a little bit. I didn't expect him to come out and tell you all the things that he thought was wrong with the D or all of his mistakes. But I kind of thought he would he would be a little bit more accountable on that and not talk about you know you have a vision, you have a process, and maybe sometimes it just goes awry as an outlier. I don't think last year was an outlier. I don't think you think was an outlier and i know that when we went into last year we believed that the eagles were far less deep um on defense and that that could come back to haunt them we said that many many times and it really did come back to haunt them not only that i mean even when they weren't injured they just didn't have enough talent up the middle to be able to hang with the best teams in the nfl all right so talk to joe banner former eagles president about a week ago he goes remember what i told you guys when i was on your show before the season started i said yeah you said the team is not as talented as people think it is on defense, it's primarily on defense. He knew they're they're stacked on offense. I said, yeah, but I I was like, look, I said you can't account for injuries. But what Joe said is, you worry about the older secondary. Totally fair, and that unfortunately wound up to coming to fruition. Definitely. And the other thing he said about linebacker, and he reminded me of this. He goes, he goes, why does everyone talk about the linebacker so much? Like he he never said he wanted linebackers not to be good. He said. It cannot be a weakness. You could be okay there, just average, but you can't be a weakness. That he see, he he was pretty emphatic. He goes, I never said it, it's acceptable to have a weakness. Never. Right. He he thought because look, sometimes they did sometimes what they wound up doing was it wound up being a weakness. Maybe they didn't think it was, but it wound up being a weakness. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But yeah, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the defensive side of the football. Now, what Howie was talking about, it's funny how he mentioned a Kobe Dean. 
who I think we all thought they got a good value, but he's missed so much time. And I know in our Andrew Ducheco talked to him. It's a great article on insidethebirds.com. I suggest you read it. Talk about his Liz Franck uh, rehab. So he should be good to go in the, in the, during their OTAs. But again, he's barely played first two years. Zach Cunningham was a nice find for them, but he's unsigned. He's been hurt. Uh, Nick, I mean, Nick Marr is really a good backup. So how much certainty do they have at linebacker right now? Not a lot, my friend. I mean, not a lot. And and again, Nick Nicobe Dean can't be deemed a certainty. He wasn't a bad player. He just wasn't great, but he was he missed too much time. Yeah. Uh, so even if you have him come back and be a good player, you still need two or two, at least two other functional young linebackers who can play, who can stay healthy and perform the tasks that Vic Fangio is going to ask to do. And we know that linebacker and safety are important roles in a Vic Fangio defense and corner up front and, and corner. corner. Well, I feel like corner is standard. Everybody needs good corners, but right. People but you use linebackers and safeties differently than others. So the big thing on the Fangio uh, talking to someone who worked for him in the past is, and part of the reasons why he doesn't want to blitz is he just believes that the rush needs to match, you know, the marriage between the rush and coverage. He just believes in a fi- rushing five, no more than that, unless absolutely necessary, having a maximum amount of guys in coverage. He doesn't want, you know, below average quarters. That's, you know, not that anyone does, obviously. But I don't think he feels, based on the guy that I spoke with, that ha- just being average will be good enough. Like some some years, if your rush is so great, like 22, so Slay was very good. Bradbury's probably not quite as good as the second team all pro that he was. But the teams didn't throw him a lot because the rush was great. So that's another thing here. Can they get the pass rush as good as it used to be? Now, obviously, Vic will know how to break down protections better than Desai did. And Patricia, what the, the, the stuff that he threw was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Which was a disaster because he tried to change the defense, which he should never do. But the coaching's going to be better. Let, let's call it like it is. And let's what's let's see what Vic will, what brings it. We'll have more for you on this going forward. But does Howie see that okay, you've got Reddick who's terrific. Can they get sweaty back to where he was or even close to it? I don't know. He what did he fall off? Was it coaching? Was it his knee? Yeah. What is, what is Smith? What, what, what is he, what is he in this defense? What, like, you know, he was, the, the guy dropped. We could argue, was he too small? Uh, Nolan Smith is a gifted guy, but he didn't prove much as a rookie. So there's still a lot of questions with their pass rush. I agree with you. And I even have some questions overall about Fangio and the scheme that we'll get into as we break down each uh, individual hiring. Uh, and let's do that in a second. First, we got a couple of the things we want to get to. Let's pause right here so we can hear a word from our friends at Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City, the exclusive Jersey Shore resort of Inside the Birds. Go to get your game on. Go for the beers. Go for the cheers. Go for the hit and the hits. Go for the stakes and the stakes. Go to get your parlay on. Go to get your party on. Go for the scene. Go for the screens. Go for the gallery. Go for the win. Go to Ocean. Visit theoceanac.com to plan your visit. All right, Adam. Um, Obviously, as we've mentioned, because you have two new coordinators who tend to have experience there, we expect and anticipate that some they'll have some say in, in people they bring in. So we'll get to that in a second. But that's part of what we'll be doing in Mobile, Alabama, trying to get intel on that. So we'll have our show, our our Wednesday pod will actually be recorded, right, from Mobile, because I'll be there by Tuesday. Uh, We'll do that. We'll record our pod by Wednesday. And then we're going to have also some special content for our Patreon members. What are we doing for our Patreon members? Oh, yeah, we're going to have a live stream, our live Q&A. Ask ITB will be done from Mobile. And uh, we'll have the first two days of practices. We'll talk about that, what we saw. And by the way, I wish I would have known how good Puka Nakua was when I saw him. Man. <laughs> you and like 31 other teams. I know. <laughs> I know. Oh, my God. I mean, he was in the quarter. The funny thing was the quarterback was mostly pretty bad. But he, uh, I mean, again, I know Sean McVay is special as a play caller and understanding how to create space. But that's the thing, man, going back to B West here in 2002 and Javon Walker, uh, my bit, my biggest, my two best takeaways and what I saw, I called Greg Cosell and Ron Jaworski at NFL Films. I said this, I said, I, he may not be for everyone, but this Russell Wilson, I, I didn't know anything about him other than he was a transfer from, um, NC state to Wisconsin. I said, he's only five, 10 and a half, but man, this kid looks special, but we'll see. And he's too small and who knows. And then 
Jimmy Graham was incredible. See, the problem about, you know this from going there, the folks who have gone there as well, is you there's no tackling, there's no scheming defensively. So guys could just run scot free. But the guy's six foot seven and can move like this. He's a basketball player at the University of Miami. I'm like, this is incredible what this kid's doing. Yeah. We'll see. And then for many years, he's pretty good. Never know. There you go. Yeah. So look forward to seeing some of that too and getting some intel there. But we're also going to pop on Discord uh, oh, yeah. a few times while we're down in Mobile for our Patreon members who, who like to I connect with us a lot. on Discord. Yeah. Good. I like it. Excellent. I like it. All right, let's talk about the Kellen Moore hire. Um, I'm, I'm, when you talk about both of these hires, Adam, I'm a little bit more tantalized by the Kellen Moore hire um, than the Vic because I, I guess it's because we know how much talent they have on offense, and yeah. we know that Kellen Moore brings an interesting blend. Like when we, when this process started, when we knew Brian Johnson was going to fire and they were going to bring in somebody, we knew they wanted to bring in someone who had an expertise in downfield passing, stressing defenses, getting vertical, which the Eagles have done well. Um, they just didn't do a good job last this past year of hitting on it frequently enough, but also someone who can scheme guys open. And what I find really fascinating about Kellen Moore is I think he blends two concepts. He sort of started his career, coaching career, as a Eric Coriel guy with his downfield concepts. But I read a story... Uh, in one of the the um, papers that covers the Chargers online, and in his introductory press conference, he talked about the impact Mike McCarthy had on him in his what two years, right? That he was coaching there, right? Cause, right, and he he doesn't he didn't have the West Coast in his his background, right? Right, and he um, talked about right. bringing that blend of those two schools of thought to the Chargers, which uh, poor guy, I'm sure he wanted to, but he never had the whole healthy core of herbert oh. mike williams yeah. and eckler and uh and um Keenan Keenan Allen. Allen intact right. but he's got those tools here and i look forward to seeing that blend because we know the eagles are built to be able to hit you on a variety of levels we talk about this all the time over the middle with goddard and and Devontae, up top with Devontae and aj brown on the perimeters with whatever running backs they've got. They usually have pass catching running backs. We'll see. I think this is a good marriage of mindset and coaching influence to the personnel. Yeah. I, I look, he, he's just what we call space creator in the NFL world and coaching world. They call him like McVay and Shanahan are the two best, but he's a different guy because he, he as someone close to him told me his system is based largely on what he got in Boise, which is spread. He integrated pro concepts as he went along. He's worked with different coaches. Jason Garrett, you mentioned Mike McCarthy. Those two guys have had an influence on him. You know what's interesting is that Mike McCarthy, when he got the job, owner, general manager, president, uh, Jerry Jones said, you're not calling the plays. Our guy, Kellen Moore, is going to call the plays. Yes. And then what happened was, people want to know what happened with Kellen. is like, Mike and Jerry had to say yes. Mike said, I'm calling the plays. And, and, and it, obviously, Kellen's not going to take a downgrade to just be a OC without play calling. So he had to go. And there were a bunch of teams involved. I think Kellen Moore's out of work for like 24 to 40 hours last year. So <laughs> he's one of the – you tell me if you've heard this. This is something I've, I've gotten to know. Uh, not uh, just a lot of co uh, offensive coaches. It's one of the few coaches that coaches who are there, – there's a lot of competitive jealousy. Nobody, nobody has a bad word to say about this guy. Not just as a person, but – He's such a good schemer and designer that because you'll find guys will find something to criticize these guys about. It's hard, man. I asked like five or six coaches either work for him or, or know his system. Like, no, they think he's brilliant for a young guy. They think he's up. Uh, I don't know about yes. Ben Johnson, but they, they think he's pretty much up there. Yes. And I, and I can't help but like think of the irony of the situation where Mike McCarthy convinces Jerry Jones, he's got to be the play caller. They need to move on from Kellen Moore. And he basically says, you know, we've got to, we got to be more of a West coast offense, more balanced yeah. offense. Right. So then he takes over and they start off trying to be balanced. And then Dak just has these really good games. And then by the end of the year, they're literally not conceptually because they're still a West coast offense, but they're literally throwing the ball as much as anybody in the NFL. They finished eighth, the Cowboys in attempts. They finished number one in passing touchdowns and number three in passing yards. So all that convincing about, more balance and not passing it by the end of the year they were throwing the ball around well, as much as they could it's because of Braun schottenheimer i bet the house he 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 was the one behind let russ cook in 2020 he their front office had gotten pete carroll at least to at least listen potentially come out throwing in the first half of games 
And Wilson was on pace for uh, uh, like 48 passing touchdowns. He was on absolute just the first half of that 2020 season was remarkable. And then teams started to adjust and Pete Carroll started to micromanage a little bit and Schottenheimer, uh, unfortunately, had to part ways with uh, Pete. Pete wasn't having this passing offense. He didn't want it. Right. But Shotty's pretty aggressive. And if as you fast forward here, there's no question he got in Mike's ear, and it's worked. Hey, look, they haven't missed uh, Kellen Moore. <laughs> You're right. You're up to 100% right. But so here's what happened. Week three uh, f- for the Chargers, Mike Williams towards the ACL at Minnesota. Then – Keenan Allen, who, by the way, was on pace. This is ridiculous, but he was on pace for somewhere between 180 and 200 pass targets. It was ridiculous the kind of numbers he was putting up. And there's this great article. I don't. I wish I could find the quote. He loved the scheme because Joe Lombardi, who got criticized for being too provincial in his thinking, dink and dunk, not enough, not enough um, vertical. More challenges everything: short, intermediate, and 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 down and nine routes and downfield. So they kept moving him. It was more of a he wasn't just a slot receiver. He's more of a Z this past season, and it showed. Nobody, he was putting up monster numbers. Nobody could cover him, but he had a heel injury, missed the final four games. Justin mm-hmm. Herbert missed the final four games. Yep. Uh, he got a, actually two injuries, but that's what the last one cost him the miss of time. And Josh Palmer had two different injuries. One was a knee injury. It's pretty significant. And Quentin Johnson was not ready. Their first round pick out of TCU. They knew that in training camp, talking to the Chargers about him. So, yeah, you're right. Everything went against them. It's still put up, you know, considering. And by the way, the Titans get the ball in its offense. Another thing, if you study the history of Jake Ferguson uh, and uh, Dalton Schultz and other tight ends and the tight ends uh, with the Chargers this past season, particularly in the red zone, the tight ends will get the football. I'm hoping you mentioned Goddard earlier Mm -hmm. because the misuse of him, we could talk whether everybody talks about how athletic and how, how good of a player he is, but he's sort of underachieved. He should be better. I don't think Brian Johnson did a good job or Sirianni together, whatever, however they yeah. did it. I don't think they schemed him up well enough, quite frankly. Adam, it's the first thing that I thought of. I mean, it's not going to be hard in my opinion. You know, we'll see what happens. It shouldn't be hard for Kellen Moore, if he's just good at what he does, as he's been, to figure out ways to get the ball to A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. I want to see what he can do. And you nailed it on the head because Dalton Schultz was not expected to be as good of a player as he became in Dallas. Now we know Dak is really adept at throwing to his tight end because we've seen them move on from Dalton Schultz and Jake Ferguson, who also wasn't supposed to be the guy wow, <laughs> they drafted Schoonmaker oh, in the second round, just exploded. So that yes. might be a Dak thing, but as you mentioned, he, he his track record followed him to LA, which doesn't have a great tight end, but the, in the red zone they were used. And then you come here with Dallas Goddard. I'm really fascinated to see what he can do with Dallas Goddard. Uh, you nailed it right in the head. Can't he wait. better get the ball to Smith. And yeah. I think oh, yeah. any offensive coordinator is going to do that, but it's really how he gets the ball. And then also tries to get the ball to the running backs in the passing game. Oh, like able to do with Tony Pollard. Oh, uh, three years and ago Eckler. Yeah. Right. I thought Eck- now Eckler, I know some, we'll, we'll address some of the negatives. Why didn't Eckler do better? And you know, there's a reason folks that the Chargers didn't extend his contract. He's not, he's an unbelievably uh, great running back out of the backfield. He's just not, He's not a guy that you're going to pound the rock with. Right. And yeah, Eckler didn't do as well. Um, he, they thought uh, the Chargers felt like he was, this might be sort of like the downfall, sort of regression for him. You got to be careful with running backs. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to not kill him more. There, there's, I know the Cowboy fans, they, they it's so funny in social media. You know, sometimes fans latch on to stuff they don't like. They just were relentless. So more would call some trick plays or misdirection plays like inside the 20 when they, just run out like a normal play, and it would drive fans crazy. It would make me laugh. The memes, like, here it goes, Kellen Moore, once again, calling the stupid stuff, you know, in the red zone. You know, the fans get that. That's fine. They 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 can't help themselves sometimes. They latch on to that stuff. But it, I, I agree with you. That I cannot wait to see what he does. I'll be – I'd be stunned if, if everybody's healthy, the key players, if this doesn't – if this offense isn't just as good, if not better, than the Super Bowl team. I know that's saying a lot. But, man, this guy is really good. And the thing is, the third receiver – um, a coach of source told me, he goes, do not be surprised if the third receiver, because he plays a lot of heavy 11, not a big 12 personnel guy, he's more of 11, some 10, depending on the talent level. 10 means, folks, no tight ends, one running back, four receivers. 11 is one running back, three receivers, and one tight end. So I'm, I'm, it, it really, another thing that if we listed our top 10 pet peeves of this uh, this past season, their offense, don't give me the, like, like Sirianni's excuse was, okay, well, you know who the ball's going to go to, our top three guys. 
So then don't play, th- th- don't use a third receiver. Don't even have a third receiver out there. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> right. His excuse. That was BS. Yeah. That, that bothered me. To be honest. Yeah. No, no doubt about it. And listen, like th- after the Williams injury, Josh Palmer became their number three receiver and he's a pretty good player. And if the Eagles can find a number three who has that kind of vertical stretch ability, I mean, it was Palmer and then it became Quentin Richardson, the rookie, as he developed a little bit later in the year. But Quentin if you Johnson get this guy, Johnson. I'm sorry, Quentin Johnson, right? Um, as it as it goes on, then that gives the, the team another dimension. But again, that's why you also have Goddard to sort of be that that guy as well and that third option in the passing game. I just want to read to you real quickly. Before the injury settled in, if you look at the first three weeks of the Chargers season, uh, they scored 34 points. 24 points against a Titans defense, which is pretty good. You know, every time you have to go face Tennessee in Tennessee, you can score 24. That's pretty good. And then 28 against the Vikings. So before the injury settled in, they were moving the ball and scoring a lot of points offensively. But then we know what happened. Mike Williams got hurt in that third game. And then after that, it got a little uh, got a little dicey there as far as personnel. Eckler, you mentioned being hurt. And then E. Keenan Allen. And then later in the season, it was Justin yeah. Herbert. Yeah, so. so great job by the Eagles. I got to tell you, I... Uh... We had plenty to criticize them. I mean, it, I know people got on us for being so negative last season. We just tell it, we, we, we got underneath the hood, right? We yeah. Go, we, we, our job is not to read a bunch of numbers. You can find that anywhere on the internet. We, we, we want to go by, what does the tape look like? We're a tape-based show. We're an information intel-based show. And what happened last season was unacceptable. I have no problem with the changes. It's unfortunate that Sirianni deserves a lot of blame. Obviously, Hertz does as well. He regressed. Doesn't mean he can't be great again. Coach has got to be better. Uh, and we'll have to see what happens here. But uh, great job by Howie Roseman and Nick Sirianni to bring these guys in. And I'm so interested to see what this thing looks like in OTAs. You, you learn a lot, by the way, in OTAs. A, a little bit more than I anticipated over the years. Usually more good than bad. Yeah, 100%. All right. Um, I want to get back also into the offensive coaching staff now and how it might change in a second. But whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you're going to love. Delivered right to your door. So you've resolved to actually sit down and eat dinner around the table. Hey, what a concept, right? But what do you do about those nights when your schedule is packed? We know all about that. You turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including They're 15-minute recipe meals. They're designed to help you minimize meal time stress. That is my type of meal. Every time I eat a HelloFresh meal, whether it's one of those quick and easies or just their standard type of meals, I am blown away by the freshness, the taste, and the overall quality that they produce. And we've tried so many great options. There's really something for everybody, a meat lover, a seafood lover, a vegetarian. If you like variety and all of that, you can get that. So go to HelloFresh.com and slash, I'm sorry, go to HelloFresh.com slash Eagles free and use the promo code Eagles free, all one word, lowercase, for free breakfast for life. That's right. You get one breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. So you get free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Eagles free. It's E-A-G-L-E-S-F-R-E-E. And you use that promo code Eagles free, all one word on, and all small, uh, lowercase. So act now for America's number one meal kit. All right. So we know um, the offensive staff underneath Kellen Moore is going to change. In fact, Alex Tanny begin, give, has been given permission to seek employment elsewhere, Adam. That, that's an indication that, you know, other guys are going to be brought in, which you know, I, I, I hate to keep saying we talked about this, we talked about this, but we did going into the year. We talked about moving on from Brian Johnson, who had worked with Jalen Hurts for a couple of years, and then promoting Alex Tanney, who people thought highly of, but still a first-year guy. He had just been offensive quality control, and now you're in charge of being the position coach and the most important player on the team. That's a difficult ask. All right, so what we talked about the final six weeks of the season was when Hurts really, it, it was a struggle bus is that they have a first-year quarterback coach. He's running a room for the first time in his career. That's really hard to do Mm -hmm. uh, without any experience. He just retired not too long ago. And I know it's very smart. The Eagles were very high on him, but it was a big ask. See, this is where either Marcus Brady should have got more involved, where they should have had someone to nurture him. 
as a coach and that 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 Nick could have done a better job with I I wanted to mention that um when when we started talking about it in, in uh, December because it was it's kind of evident that that was one of the many mistakes Sirianni made and he didn't really understand when you put a first time when you just won the Super Bowl I mean, excuse me, when you just got there and you want to get back you want to make sure that you've got the the best coaching that a guy can get and Tanya, as smart as he is, that doesn't mean he's a great coach. He's never run a room before. And that that's a tough ask, man. I, I thought that was a mistake by Nick. And you know, I know that he's very smart, and I wish him the best of luck. He was put in a tough spot. And that's that's something, look, uh, for what we heard, Doug Nussmeyer is the is a guy that is very close to Kellen Moore. He coached with him for uh, starting in 2018 with the Cowboys. And that th- he's he's technically still under contract to, to the Chargers. But as one coaching source told me on Sunday – It'd be a huge upset if he doesn't travel to Philly and become an Eagles new quarterback's coach, but we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. And then of course we'll have to see what happens with the other coaches on the staff, you know, running backs coach, wide receivers coach. I don't, I'm pretty sure that Jeff Stoutland isn't going anywhere. Yeah, uh, He is still the run game coordinator. So a big part of what they're going to do offensively, but obviously we have to see about uh, you, as you mentioned, Marcus Brady was given permission and I think he has interviewed uh, elsewhere as well. Oh. I, I, I wish that Alex Tanny could stay and maybe be an assistant quarterbacks coach because he was so highly thought of and such a good planner. They talked about his detail when he was doing projects that it's, this is the unfortunate part where you just discard a guy who might have a good future. I don't know why he couldn't stay, but maybe he gets an opportunity and maybe if he doesn't, he will come back. I I don't know. I just thought it would have been nice to be able to try to figure out a way to hold on. What they could do. And some teams, I know the jets did this with, um, the quarterbacks coach they put they brought in someone to be a senior offensive assistant or a pass game coordinator who could help nurture him. Uh, but yeah, I, that's actually a really good thought. Maybe they could have done that. Is if Nussmeyer comes in, yeah, he could coach the quarterbacks, but maybe not. Maybe you just keep Tanny having the title, but it is what it is, and we'll see what happens with that quarterback coaching job and the rest of the offensive staff. But they 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 did a good job here. I cannot wait to see what this thing looks like. Is there any downside here as far as not, 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 not from um, what he brings from an offensive expertise standpoint, but this is a guy the Eagles interviewed for head coach yeah. in 2021. Um, and they wound up hiring Nick Sirianni. So there, I don't know if there's a little, going to be some ego involved where Nick knows that this guy was hired, you know, was, was they, he got hired over Kellen, but now they need Kellen to rescue him. Uh, as you mentioned, as he goes Weird. into the hot seat, I, and plus it's not the same offense. And even though Nick has talked about giving autonomy to the offensive play caller, he's also talked about, well, this guy would be crazy not to take some of our great concepts that have worked in the past. You just don't know how things are going to work. You know, everybody was so optimistic several years ago when they brought Marty in for Doug and that guy, Rich Gangarello, we talked about Andrew Briner. Oh, you've got all these different systems and it wound up being a mess. And you just hope that this thing has better camaraderie from the start, but you can't definitively predict that it will. Actually, that's a really good point. I remember because it didn't, it seemed like Scangarell was forced on Peterson. Mm-hmm. It just seemed really awkward. Whereas, okay, Nick did not have a good year. The The, the scheme got beaten up. It, it, I hate this term, but this one is a fact as the tape show, this teams have figured out the Eagles offense and they didn't do a good job adjusting. Whereas Nick had to get outside of his own skin and, and, and hire, bring in a new scheme. Uh, so I, again, it's Kellen Moore's a proven play caller. Really, really good. He's also not like a 70 year old guy. He's like 35 There's right no here. I think, I don't know. If, I don't know when he turns 36. So that's the amazing thing about Kellen Moore. Heck, I remember at the senior ball out of Boise, a lefty gunslinger. Mm-hmm. Didn't have a very good arm. He's an undirected free agent, but he's a heck of a play caller. So we'll see. But uh, as you said, I think it's a fair point with their offensive talent, skill position, AJ Brown's back, Smith's back, Goddard's back. Stall's back uh as the as the as the, as the wide tight end, as a number two tight end. Calcaterra's under contract, so they're good there. Mylotta Dickerson, Jurgens, Lane Johnson. We'll see about Kelsey if he goes through with his retirement. Ty- Tyler Seen's a developmental player. We'll see what he does. Now Swift's not signed. Uh the only back under contracts game well so they've got a little bit of work to do with swift i think he'd fit in great here as you mentioned earlier look how good tony pollard did and he fell off boy did he fall off this past season mm-hmm. under the blocking scheme changed and maybe that was part of it but it's uh i that's probably what more i'm gonna there's someone i i know someone who knows more very well i wonder if more saw of all the opportunities that he had did he say oh my goodness look at this 
look at the talent level I could work with her. How could I not take this? I, I wonder if that was part of his thinking. Uh, it's a really good question. Think, right? It is a very good question there. Because as you you just pointed out, you had there's probably not too much offensive talent better out there where he was interviewing yeah. or looking around. However, the whole job security thing might have been one where you're like, eh, I don't that know. I don't, never want to go right. take a you know, guys on a hot sure. seat. So sure. uh, really interesting trade off. And the last thing I'll say before we get to defense is I really hope Brian Johnson does land on his feet in a similar position because I would really like to see him with autonomy over an offense for our sake, just to get a better picture of what his offense might look like and his play calling might look like if it's play calling from an offense that he has more autonomy over. I don't want to close the book on him. I think at times people are a little unfair because it is Nick Sirianni's offense. And even in some of the press conferences, I thought Brian was trying to say, you know, like he, you know, this was not, you know, it's, it, you know, I, I just remember one person asking him if, if he had taken into account like the other team's scoring at the time when he was calling his offense and he sort of gave this answer like hey listen i just do what i'm told type thing so i'm i'm very curious to see how brian johnson responds from this yeah i i, I agree it's uh look it's such an odd happening when a team gets to the super bowl close to winning next year they fire both def offense and defense coordinator it's just so odd and there are going to be other changes obviously in the state both both staffs both sides of the football it is weird, man, but it is what it is, and this is what happens. you got a very demanding owner. There's a reason why they've had such excellence over his 30 years of Jeffrey Lurie's ownership. And we could always debate whether he should get as involved as he does. We know he gets very involved, and he, he's a very involved owner. He he's, he's into it. There's nothing wrong with that. I do wonder, though, and we'll talk about this down the road when Jeffrey gives it up to his son, Julian. Will Julian be as demanding as Jeffrey? Tip off the old block, right? Apple falling far from the tree. Maybe. We'll see. It's it's hard to say. We don't know yeah. that. Julie. Definitely. All right, Adam, you know, the Super Bowl is going to be a couple of weeks, and it really sucks for Eagles fans that the Eagles are not there. What also sucks? Trying to find good tickets online. Unless you've got the Game Time app. It is the fast, easy way to buy tickets for sporting events, concerts, theater shows near you. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And right now in the Game Time app, you're just two taps away from tickets to any local sports teams, pro, college, any concerts, any comedy acts, whatever you want to see. The best part is Game Time offers event cancellation protection and job loss protection. It's the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. They're all in prices, show you the total right up front, and you get to see the view from your seat. So you know exactly what you're getting at checkout. Game Time's obsessed with helping you save money. They've got the zone deals that let you pick the section while game time picks the seats. So you get the best savings. And then there's the game time guarantee. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time credits, you 110% of the difference. So download the game time app, create an account, use code birds for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and use the redeem code birds B I R D S all one word for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today, last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed all right so the funny thing about the Vic Fangio hire is that you know this is the template defense that they've been running for the last three years and now they actually have the true him. architect to be able to run it um he's a demanding guy Adam and this is where I think is going to be interesting uh I don't know if you saw the Drew Rosenhaus thing where he I did. Yeah. I did. He's like, listen, there's a lot of these dolphins that weren't happy, that weren't upset to see him go. And now he comes to a team, and we don't know exactly who's coming back as far as BG and Fletch and some of the veterans. But you know, we we saw how Hassan Reddick uh, reacted to some of his usage uh with the Desai and both Patricia. And you got Darius Slay, big personality. So I I think the biggest thing I wonder is. Is there going to be total buy-in? You know that these guys have ran his defense before, but they may not have been coached the way they're about to be coached. Yes. Right. So you, you you kind of wonder how that's going to go over. Usage is interesting. So you got to see I, – I, I, I'm going to research this. Cleo Mack has an incredible, incredible quote when uh, he when Vic – Vic, the best job he may have – we could always debate what the numbers look like, but – they thought Vic was a savant with the Bears. The work that he did and that helped get him, obviously, the Broncos head coaching job was just remarkable. And Cleo Mack, Cleo Mack never had played better in his career. I mean, he was incredible with Vic. So that's one thing to look at. And, boy, Jalen Phillips, before he tore his Achilles, was awesome. Before he got hurt, he had a breakout season. And 
Bradley Chubb revived his career until he suffered a second ACL injury. So we, we could go through. And I remember talking to um, our friend Bill Poley, and Bill said the reason why they dismissed him is because he couldn't coach, he, he couldn't run uh, Tampa two. That's not his defense. No. When Dungey came in, he had to go. Kind of weird. It's like, it's only one of the best D coordinators of the last 30 years, but you can't keep him. I get it. He can't run the scheme, so he had to go. But uh, no, it's, it. look, this is the true match cover and deliver system. It's called mirror match coverage. We've talked about this ad nauseum for the three years that this group has been in here. We're talking about Sirianni and the defensive guys in the system that they run. Um, you, 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 it's zone coverage. You carry them to a certain, whatever your landmark is, and you hand it off to somebody else. And it's, you, you, you don't blitz very much at all. You, you really do. Now they try, Vic ran out of players against Baltimore. He might've had this, but they got smoked, but they ran out of players. This is when they, who are the old guys that they signed off the scrap heap for that, that game? It's ridiculous. Oh my God. You're gonna have to, uh, Melvin Ingram, one, Cliff Averill. And Justin Houston, not right? Cliff Averill. No, 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 not Cliff. He Cliff wasn't signed by the. All right, then it was Justin Houston. But no, it was Ingram. You got it. Bruce Irvin was the other. Bro, that's what I meant. Not, not who did I say? Cliff Averill. Cliff Averill. Oh, yeah. Wait. Uh, in fairness, yeah. I'm just doing Detroit. a six degree. Didn't Averill? Yeah. All right. Averill and Irvin played together on that Seahawks defense. Sure. That one the first okay. Time. Okay. So, I was just mixing matching one outside. Right church, wrong oh. pew. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, Van Ginkle became a player. I mean, yeah. I, I have no for a fact. We were laughing. Remember, we said a couple of weeks ago because they were they ran out of inside linebacker. Jerome Baker kept getting hurt, and Van Ginkle had to play outside. Duke Riley was starting for Le Eagle Legend, not Legend. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, you do what you have to do, but so yeah, he's going to run a system. He is he is the man with this thing. Uh, oh, in our count, the only five teams to run it, the Fangio system, were the Eagles, of course, not very well. Um, that's the problem. Uh, Miami, of course. Uh, Carolina ran it really well. Jiro Aviro uh, worked for Vic in Denver. He's tremendous. In fact, that's why he got head coaching opportunities. He's really a sharp guy. Mm -hmm. Carolina blocked him from uh, interviewing for other D coordinator jobs. He's great. The, the Chargers on a brand Staley didn't do a good job. Now, I was told with Arizona, they didn't run full Fangio. They, because um they're 30 old the kid who was here nick uh, rollis they were doing some but not all but carolina definitely did chargers definitely did Vic did obviously and the eagles did and I, it, it the thing that is clear with this stuff if you don't have the right first of all the right play caller no matter how great your talent is it ain't gonna work and that that was the problem uh with, with here is the guys that well, obviously decide Although the talent level obviously dropped off from last year. We know about the five starters being gone and obviously Maddox getting hurt. I don't think, I think what ha hurt the size, he did not have enough experience to overcome the drop off in talent. And look, you want to put it on him too. Sure. And obviously Roseman, he's the one who, who signed and didn't sign players, but uh, the coaching clear was not good enough. And that was part of it. Yeah. I, I, I looked at the Miami. I wondered this too about Vic and coaching in Miami, right? Because I remember, I think I've mentioned this on a, prior pod before recently jim johnson in 2008 was sort of annoyed by how fat how the eagles offense was far more explosive than it was deliberate and so his defense constantly oh. had a good can you remember that was deshaun jackson's i think rookie year right and McNabb to jackson was a thing like right from the start if you go look at some of the first six seven eight games defense struggled but the offense they were just outscoring everybody just bombing away with Deshaun and I forget who else was on that team. Um, they were just doing a good job of, of scoring really lightning quick. And and Jim Johnson would joke about ah, ball control offense that we got there because his defense would have to go out on the field oh, all the time. Oh. And I wonder if Miami's offense and all the explosion took a toll on, you know, on his defense and, and having to be out there, huh. especially with all the injuries they had. Someone who coached with Vic on offense and Denver said it Vic is a run the game, but he's a run the ball guy. He kind yeah. of, oh, he is about as old school. He wants to hide the quarterback. That ain't happening here. They're going to throw it. But his thing was like, limit the, you know, ball control, limit the, the uh, dropbacks to the quarterback win with run game and defense, but that ain't happening here. Although these would love to win with his defense and see what, uh, see what the front office does to help him. Yeah. And Vic, it's not like Vic doesn't know this going in. Like he, I guess Vic feels like I'm getting out of my – anywhere I go is not going to be as crazy with Waddle and Hill as as what I just witnessed. So, like, you know, even though the Eagles have explosive – I mean, the Eagles have – when they're at their best, they're actually a very good ball control team. 
you know, they don't have to always score explosively to win. They've won many games just being a ball control grind. Even when they went to the Super Bowl, um, some of their best games, they were like that. So Vic's getting away from the circus offense and, and getting into, he knows what he's getting into with Philadelphia. He knows they want to throw the ball. So it's not like he's going to be surprised by that. Oh, yeah, it was around the team. I mean, 20, I don't know how many times he – we know he was a consultant during the playoffs, but, you know, he would visit the team periodically throughout the season, so he knows. Right. You know, I wonder if he knows Jeffrey. I wonder if uh, – you know, he knows all the – he knew all the coaches and some of the front office members. I wonder if he ever talked to Jeffrey. Because you mentioned – we know Jeffrey wants to throw the football, so I wonder mm-hmm. if he got to know him. But uh, it's – again, to summarize this so we can move forward here, it, it's pretty remarkable that you can get two of the best coordinators in the National Football League uh, but as you said, and you, you and I agree on this totally, Howie's got a lot of work to do on the back end of the defense. It's clearly not good enough. There's yeah. no everyone watching knows this. So I will say this about not a downside, but a but a, something that I sort of thought I was looking forward to when they were doing interviews is when they brought in um, Mike Caldwell. Yeah, I liked the philosophy behind that, and and I I have nothing against Mike Caldwell. I think he's actually done a decent job in places he's been. Um, and if he's winds up being the linebackers coach, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which he's interviewed, I think that's great because again, it's like another experienced adult in the room there. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that I was sort of excited by was maybe a return to that kind of defense where it's not about blitzing a lot. It's just about where you're attacking from. And Mike Clawwell comes from the Todd Bowles tree, but he also played under Jim Johnson. Right. So I was, a, I was wondering if the Eagles were sort of looking for a defense that can attack you from multiple levels. Again, you, you got a front oh. rush, you can get a linebacker blitz, you can get a nickel, like a Steve Spagnolo defense. Steve Spagnolo, just like Jim, doesn't, but it might look like he's blitzing all the time. He's really not. It's just that he'll bring Simulation. Trent McDuffie yes. from the nickel. He'll bring his safety. It, simulated. It's, right. Okay. It's that right simulated pressure or a fifth man that you talked about, a five man rush, which isn't like a crazy blitz, but that five fifth man could be anybody on the field from nickel to outside corner to safety to linebacker. That's where I thought maybe the Eagles were starting to gravitate toward when they brought in Mike Caldwell. And who else did they talk to? Uh, Joe Barry was reported. I forget who put it out there. Who, who... Well, that was for linebackers coach. Though, right, right. Correct. Yeah. Not yeah. just for linebackers coach. And look, Joe Barry, see, he's familiar with the defense. I don't know if he, I don't know. Cause if you remember, he coached under, he took over for Wade Phillips when Wade Phillips got canned. Mm-hmm. With as a Rams D coordinator, I, I think he did. I have to look it up. I know he was working for the Rams, but I, I don't. I, we have to get that confirmed because if, if you ran full Fangio or most of it, that would be the six team that ran it mm-hmm. last season. So we'll, we'll have to find out. So yeah, uh, but but uh, yeah, the coaches always bring in not they guys they know that they know that could coach. And by the way, Mike Caldwell, the only similarity is he coached the thirty four front. He ran a 34 front with with uh, Jacksonville. Vic runs a 34 front. Now, here's the question. How much five-man front do they run? We, we, that's something that we'll have to find out. We'll, we'll learn early on as we, as we see in OTAs and training camp exactly what they're doing and how he deploys personnel. That's the fun thing about this because – he hasn't coached you. We don't know how he's going to do that. Right. Well, we do. Well, the only thing we we kind of get a good feel for is attack from all three levels is not a Fangio thing like that. No, like he's not, a, he doesn't yeah, not going to blitz a whole lot. And if he no, is the fifth guy, and it's usually a a guy on the line anyway. Yeah. So, all right. Um, one more point before we go. Let's st- uh, pause and hear from our friends at Sky Motor Cars. Sky Motor Cars in Westchester is a different sort of dealership. All it takes is one look at their Highline pre-owned vehicles that people over the country want to see. Owner Brett Shoulder, make sure you don't spend a dime of your money before you purchase the car. Sky Motor Cars allows you to make all the decisions regarding your next vehicle. At Sky Motor Cars, you never have to spend more than necessary. Visit SkyMotorCars.com today or call 610-918-7225. All right, if you stop into Sky Motor Cars, make sure you tell them Adam just sent you, you will get a great deal. So we'll we'll have to see, Adam, what results of a couple of coaches here. Yeah, defensive line coach, Tracy Rocker, the edge edge rusher coaches, Washburn. Uh, we know that they're looking at linebackers coach, and, and we'll have to see what – I think the secondary oh. coaching staff is going to be really big because Vic is also kind of a – that's his, his specialty along with being a defensive coordinator – 
Uh, and we'll be down in Mobile getting some intel on that. But I, I would think there would be some changes there, it, if not in personnel, at least in in the style of coaching. There's got oh, there'll be that secondary. There's got to be, yeah. He, they're definitely going to be coaching on defense. Uh, um, new guys added on defense. There's, I mean, I, it's just a question: Do they add seven, eight, ten, three, four? It's just whatever he thinks he needs. Howie will they'll take they'll give Vic whatever he needs. I, mm-hmm. I don't. Howie needs to do a better job, as we said, at least in terms of the back seven. He's got to supplement that, upgrade it. Sure, he'll do that. They love Vic and they want to help him. Look, they want to. This team, okay, dropped off last season. Offense could be fantastic under more. It's not like they have to rebuild the defense. They have some good players, and some of some of the young kids. Carter's got to be more consistent. Davis has got to get himself in better shape and 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 play better. And that's the other thing. You bring you bring in a guy with who coaches with discipline, has been there and done that. Let, let's see. Let's see how how much of an impact he can get with the discipline. That's another thing we we didn't talk a lot about because we, we haven't seen him coach here, but I'm interested, uh, you know, uh, Andrew DeCecco had a good note uh, on that. You know, how, uh, what was that thing? He was it before practice they had a walkthrough or something. What was that again? Uh, it was like a 10 minute communication drill where they, all they worked on is, do you know where, you know, how to communicate in certain yeah. situations and where you're supposed to be, which it, my God, if, if the Eagles could have just communicated better on, motion and bunch formations and things like that might have uh-huh. made the slightest difference in a couple of games that could have maybe not led to such a free fall i mean that was such a season-long issue just people knowing uh-huh. where they're supposed to be and not blowing coverages and assignments well when patricia took over i've never seen in my career worse i mean I, maybe you've seen it where it was so embarrassingly bad oh, the communication man, bad. because because patricia foolishly asked him to do things that they had not been coached to do i mean he started running some of his stuff he thought they could handle it. They couldn't. I mean, it's just not fair to put the players in, in a position like that. And they'll, uh, Vic won't do that. He, he, the, the cool thing is like, okay, a lot of them know the scheme because they've been playing in it. The guys have been holdovers. Mm-hmm. And of course, he's the master of the, the scheme. He came up with it on his own. So um, he'll have his own nuance to it. But here we go. Let's see it and let's see what how he does. All right, next podcast, you and I from Mobile, Alabama. Looking forward to a little change of scenery and uh, moving on and turning the page here on the 2023 Eagles season. That's going to do it for this episode of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. And as always, we thank you for flying with us Inside the Birds. Be sure to check out our friends at phlsportsnation.com. They're enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports teams. For the fan, by the fan is their motto. So make sure you check them out at phlsportsnation.com and on Twitter at phlsportsnation.